Hello everyone. The story of the Sand Lane that takes us back to the days of Warcraft 3, where we had Prince Arthas on a journey to become the Lich King, and on the way, he corrupted the Sunwell of the High Elves to resurrect Kelfuzad and bring her back as a Lich. Prince Kilfa Sunstrider found himself taking over leadership from his murdered father, and in honor of all those whose blood had been spilled trying to defend Quelphalus, they renamed themselves into the Blood Elves. Their found of power had made them rather addicted to that delicious magic, so the choice to blow it all up to stop the corruption from spreading to their people, that was not an easy one to make. Nor was the choice to ally with Illinor Stormrage and Lady Vash, learn the ways of draining magic from all kinds of sources, creatures and inanimate objects alike, even fell magic. But the Blood Elves, they needed to survive and they were willing to do anything. Anything. Even follow Illidan on his mission to destroy the Lich King, which eventually led them to the cold heart of Norfriend in an all-out confrontation. Now even in life, the history between the princes, that was already a strained one, as both Kilfus and Arthas had set their eyes on lovely Jaina Proudmoore, but the blonde human prince had won the major heart and she was not interested in Kill. Are you still upset that I stole Jaina from you, Kale? You've taken everything I've ever cared for, Arthas. Vengeance is all I have left. His father, his home, his people, and the one he loved. Much was taken, but not everything quite yet, as Kilfus and his troops, they were still drawing breath. As most of you know, the final confrontation would be won by Arthas, as he would merge with Ner'zhul to become the Lich King. Illidan and his forces, they retreated back to Outlands. Not all of the Blood Elves joined Kilfus though, and the few survivors that were left behind, they were scattered across the frozen wastes. One amongst them had joined Kilfus with a mission of her own, Lanafel, wielding the mighty blade called Queldalar. This sword is seriously ancient, forged in a time where the Blood Elves were still known as the Night Elves. With the aid of dragons, this weapon came to be, passed on for generations. To Lorien Dawnseeker, its former wielder, he fell when Arvis and the Scourge rampaged through their home, and Queldelar was fought to be lost forever. This was not meant to be though, as the battle-hardened warrior Lana fell, she stumbled upon the blade, and the greatest opportunity to use it again, that presented itself when Kilfus raised his army to join Illidan. Now she found herself cornered, as one by one, the Lich King sought out those who had dared to challenge him. Using Queldelar, she struck at him with all her might, but Frostmourne's evil powers, they simply overwhelmed her. Through his blade, the Lich King chose Lanafell to serve him in undeath as Queen of the Sand Lane. The now Queen Lanafell eagerly carried out her new duties, but every time that she gazed at her blade, maddening anger would swell within her as she remembered her former life. She could not afford such distractions, and with a scream that echoed throughout Ice Crown, she shattered Queldalar and flung the fractured pieces as far as she could. Now for a while, the world wouldn't hear much from the Lich King himself, but all of that changed with Wrath of the Lich King. As a pre-event, we had Prince Tenderus Murkblood, who was quite a concern for the Kirintor, as he had showed up at Karazhan, but was neither serving the Legion or the Guardian's magic. They believed that he might be serving the Lich King, so they sent an adventurers to find out more and take care of these threats. That was just a taste of what was to come though, as the Sand Lane, they were used by the Lich King to oversee the Scourge operations across the world of Azeroth, and since we ventured to Northrend itself, the home base of the Lich King, the Sand Lane presence was found nearly everywhere. So let's talk about these princes, let's talk about the Sand Lane. Starting off, we have Prince Valanar, who played his part during the Death Knight starting experience, as the scent of Scarlet Crusaders, it simply had him salivating. His taste for flesh will have to be sated later though, as there's work to be done here. Terror, chaos, slaughtering as many of the Scarlet Crusaders that we can, until he sends us over to Prince Kalisev. Now in the Burian Tundra within Northrend, we discover that Prince Valinar has infiltrated the Alliance forces under the disguise of Counselor Talbot. He sends Fasarian, the first Death Knight, to rejoin the Alliance with a special unit known only as S to the temple city of Enkala, where they were supposed to use the Scourge technology and attack the Lich King himself. What they didn't realize was that this was actually a suicide mission, meant to weaken the Alliance, take out some of their prime forces. But Vasarian, he actually survives his trap and tries to complete his mission all the same. After interrogating a lich, he travels to the top of Naxanar, floating above the city of Enkila, where Talbot reveals his true form before protection of the Lich King. My liege, the infiltration and control of the Alliance power structure by our cultists is well underway. The power you've bestowed upon me has granted me great mental influence over human minds. I bear these offerings as proof of my progress. Larissa! What have you done to my sister? You motherless elf scum! Now this is 
a surprise, Thassarian. I hadn't heard from Mograine or the other Death Knights for months. You've come to rejoin the Scourge, I take it. I would sooner save my own throat. You would pay for what you did to your old men, Arthas. For what you did to me! I swear it! Allow me to take care of the intruders, Lord. I will feed their entrails to the maggots. Do not fail me, Sandlane. Return to Ice Crown with this fool's head. Or do not bother to return. Yes, my lord. For Sarian's sister Larissa, his last remaining family, she's been mind controlled by the Sand Lane, pushing for Sarian into action. It's no easy fight though, as Valinar has the power of soul deflection, which inflicts the torment that he should be feeling upon his attacker. The agony is enough to kill almost anyone, but somehow, in some way, Vasaria knows that if he can hold on just for an extra second, that he can outlast the Sand Lane. One mighty swing of the swords, and Valinar is taken care of. What? What happened to me? Thessarion, ah, you're alive! My head won't stop spinning. Larissa! You're alright. I thought... I thought you were dead. I cannot return home with you just yet, Larissa. I am not quite done with this scourge. Don't leave me again! You want to fight for your country, but they don't even want you. They sent you here to die! You might be right, sister. My obligations to my land and king have been fulfilled. But there is something that I still owe to myself. I know that look in your eye. I'm not going to be able to talk you out of this. If you die on me again... Do not worry, Larissa. I will come back to you when I'm done. Nothing in the world will stop me from coming home to the only family that I have left. Prince Kalisef, as I mentioned, he also played his part during the Death Knight starting experience, as he was the one who told them to assassinate Major Queen Bee at the Trevis Town Registry. From that book, they learned that the Scarlet Crusaders are actually planning to set sail to Northrend in something about a Crimson Dawn. Time to bring out our delicious torture tools, as during his travels, Kalisef has learned that one can extract all the truth that a man dares to hide, with of course the proper amount of encouragement. We find out more about the Scarlet Crusade and their plans, and we take care of most of them. Later on, in the Howling Fjord in Northland again, we find the prince who's very busy with recruiting the local Vrykul. Cool. They want to add them into the Scourge army, a race that has perfected war and destruction to the point of an art form that was more than willing to cost a lot with the Lich King. They have quite a tight hold on the area, but the Horde, and specifically the Forsaken, they have escorted the settle with Arthas and would not be pushed back. Acting as the eyes and ears of the Lich King, Kalisev offers the Forsaken to abandon Sylvanas' foolish rebellion and rejoin the Lich King's army, or suffer their wrath. High Executor Anselm's reply is swift and steady. No one insults his queen, and they will never become Scourge again. The prince is able to make his escape and kill the troops that joined Anselm, but heroes, they ventured into Utgard Keep itself and made sure that the Sand Lane would cause no more trouble. In front of the eyes of the Vrykul, who foolishly pledged their allegiance to the Lich King, they took on and took care of Kalisev. I will join the night. Prince Taldrum, he's found within Dragonblight, specifically within Ankahet. This massive old kingdom is part of the once great Nerubian Empire, creatures that were taken out by the Lich King and added to his ranks. Not even their king, Anubarak, was able to hold against the might of the Lich King, but some of his people, they're still amongst the living and they carry on the fight against the Scourge. The prince always seeks to please the Lich King, which is actually why he entered the worn torn depths of Ankahet. He's in search of lost Nerubian relics that can empower the Scourge's murderous ranks. Heroes can't even engage him until they disable the wards that were once used to hide this empire. But once they've cleared the way, once the shield is down, Teldaram is ready to devour his next meal. I will feast on your remains. With a massive flame sphere and the first of blood empowering his attacks, he takes on our heroes who put up a fierce fight. Every so often, the Sand Lane vanishes from sight and reappears behind the hero, grabbing them in a tight close embrace. Their very life force is drained, but all the same, another Sand Lane goes down. Still, I hunger. Still, I 
thirst. Prince Navarius, he was found within Zuldrak, where he and the Scourge had been working very hard at turning the corpses of the Storm Giants, those that were decimated by the Lich King, into massive flesh giants, or sometimes even worse, stitching them together to create aberrations like Vrim. Geimer, the king of the storm giants, he is found inside a cage, fearing that soon enough he'll share the fate as so many others. He wants nothing more than to get out and claim his vengeance, something that we're not against. We actually help him out, we create a bit of Cephorium, we blow up his cage and we set the giant free. On his shoulder, we ride with him as the king brings the fury of the storm upon the undead. The ground quakes beneath his feet, his enemies tossed around like they're nothing. Countless numbers are slain, including Elgar the Chosen, Frim, and of course, Prince Navarius. Within the Grizzly Hills, we didn't see the Sand Lane active in the present, but a vision of the past, it shows us that they're the ones responsible for resurrecting Arugal. Archmage Arugal was the one who summoned the Worgen from the Emerald Dream into Azeroth, which would then lead to the Worgen curse spreading amongst the people of Gilneas, and here they seem to be putting his skills to good use as he now leads the local wolf cult and blesses people with the Worgen curse. We make sure to take care of business and take them out, including the Shade of Arugal. Sadly, no sand lane to be found in Storm Peaks or within Shodosar Basin, so let's fly right into Ice Crown, with of course the Citadel looming over the land. Prince Sandoval, he fights at Valhallas, sent out as the Lich King's chosen, but the more interesting story here with the Shen Lane, that is of course with Queldelar. Lanafell shattered the blades, but heroes uncovered the battered hilt within the frozen halls of Ice Crown, which then put them on a journey of reforging the mighty weapon and pointed towards Arthas once more. Lanafell, however, she does not want us to reforge the blade, and is more than happy to let us know what she's done with it. I knew this was a dragon-forged blade when I first laid eyes on it. But can it be? Is this really... Queldalar? As Quel Sarar was forged by the dragons and given to the Kaldori, its twin, Queldalar, was given to my people. The king bestowed the blade upon my friend, the Lorian Dawnseeker. But even Thalorian skill and Queldalar's magic could not save Silver Moon from the might of the Scourge. Thalorian fell before the gates of the Sunwell, buying time for others to escape. After the battle, I recovered the sword from the field. I bore it to Northrend, in the service of my prince, seeking to avenge our people's defeat. Arthas shattered our forces, and took the most powerful of us into his service as the San Lane. My memories of Thalorian went cold, and so did his blade. It was I who brought Queldalar here to return it to its makers. In breaking the weapon, so did I break its power. Queldalar will never serve another. But we're not going to give up that easily. Heroes, they took the battered hilt and the remnants of the sword through a massive questline, which eventually led them all the way back to the Sunwell and the reforging of the legendary ancient Queldalar. Its power would serve them well, as the time had come to siege Icecrown Citadel and put a stop to the threat of the Lich King. Its greatest and mightiest challenges were waiting for us on the inside, amongst them, surprisingly enough, the Blood Prince Council. Foolish mortals. You thought us defeated so easily. The Sand Lane are the Lich King's immortal soldiers. Now, you shall face their might combined. Rise up, brothers, and destroy our enemies! Naxanar was merely a setback. With the power of the orb, Valinar will have his vengeance! Taldaram, Valinar, and Kalasev, they make the return. A nice touch is that in the background, you can actually see a portal into the area in which we faced them before. 
with the Dark Fallen Orb empowering their abilities. They do their very best to change their fate and this time earn the victory that they crave. But all the same, they fall to the heroes and the way is clear straight to their queen. My queen, they come. You have made an unwise decision. The queen is not shy of sharing her gift with the enemy, as every so often she'll bite one of them, turning them into a vampire. This does grant us some gifts, like increased damage done and healing themselves as they do damage, but it also comes with a curse. If the bite is not shared with another, if the victim does not choose another to embrace the darkness like they have, then they will simply lose their mind and surrender their will to Lana Fell. A great sacrifice to make to doom another soul, but to send Lane, who once ventured here to take care of Arf's herself. She stands in a way of victory, so we rally together and we end her. But we were all getting along so well. Don't worry, Lana Fell. The mission that you once started, we are going to finish, as the heroes were able to take care of the rest of the Lich King forces and even bring vengeance upon Arthas. There must always be a Lich King though, so Bolvar Fordragon, he placed the Helm of Domination on his head and he took up the job of Jailer of the Damned. For a while, things seemed rather quiet in Northrend, with the Scourge held in check, yet with the Legion trying to invade Azeroth once again, the Death Knights and Bolvar, they made an allegiance. They worked together, using the powers of the Lich King to recruit their forces and defend the world. Some might say that their deeds were unforgivable, while others, they might understand the necessity of what they did. Either way, we saw Bolvar play a much more active role within Legion, but this video is about the Sand Lane, and their presence was only seen within the remade dungeon called Assault on Violet Holds. This prison complex within Daladan, it houses some of the most dangerous creatures out there, a perfect city to take with us to the Broken Isles. However, Dark Forces are yet again trying to use the complex to strike at the Kirentor from within, releasing the dangerous prisoners held inside. Amongst them is a blood princess, not a queen, a blood princess this time, named Talina, the daughter of Lana Fell. Some of you will be food, some will be thralls, but all of you will die. She's been locked within the Violet Hold since the Northrend campaign, suffering the gnawing pain of her eternal hunger. Now that her cell is opened, she intends to feed on the world, and like her mother, she also likes to share a gift with a vampire's kiss, which increases all damage done and also increases leech, but must once again be shared on time, otherwise you're going to lose yourself to the hunger and become bound to her will. The hunger never ends. So that is pretty much the story of the Sand Lane up till now. Uh, Blood Elves take about Arthas and turn into what we know as vampires. They're able to drain your life essence, they change their appearance, they take hold over your mind, and they even share the gift with others. I'm going to end the video with a little bit of extra information on what might go down in Battle for Azeroth. So heads up, if you don't want any spoilers about the next expansion, then please turn off the video right now. For those sticking around, now it's not a whole lot of information that we have to work with, but it appears that the Sen Lane, they're going to have the part to play within the next expansion. Specifically, read really Datamine dialogue about a prince named Draven who's working with the Hordes. Shandris Feramun leads her troops against Draven. A whole bunch of them die, but Kashan survives, and I'm actually going to assume that this is John J. Kashan, the same Rambo figure that we saw going ham within Red Ridge and the Burning Steps. Now, if you've never done the Red Ridge questline, then I can highly recommend to do it, because it's simply amazing. Anyways, her forces are nearly wiped out by the Blood Prince, but Kashan and herself survive. Then we have Rokan, Talanji and Draven that are closely working together. Draven is not really playing ball with the whole chain of command within the Hordes, with Talanji being very distrustful of the Sand Lane. She does not believe that it's wise to involve the Sand Lane of all things in this conflict, but Rokan, he lets her know that Sylvanas wants to give them a chance. They have no home left, and if they can work with us, then they have a home within the Hordes. If not, they're out, so vampires are now partying with the Hordes. Those of you that always wanted your werewolf versus vampire PvP fantasy fulfilled, you can now get it on. It also had a lot of people wonder if the Sand Lane could potentially become an allied race, as pretty much every race that comes up now, that is considered as an allied race. Now I personally think that it could be really cool to see. An origin story of the Blood Elves that are left behind in Northrend during Warcraft 3, or even a resurgence of the Sand Lane, offering their gift to those willing to take it. There's a lot of cool things that they could do with it, but we've all suggested allied races, can they do it? Yeah, it's making them a whole lot of money, and people absolutely love it when they add these allied races. Will they actually do it? Only time will tell. But I'm ready for my sexy vampire to take his place amongst the hordes. 
I really wonder how that allegiance came to be. Is it Bovar that sends them out in a ploy to get some force within the Horde? Or did they themselves make the way to the Horde to offer their services? Do they now feel a connection to Sylvanas the Forsaken, that they're no longer a slave to the Lich King? There are so many questions and I can't wait to see it all explained. But for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. I really hope you enjoyed the story of the Shen Lane. If you did, by all means, subscribe, hit the like button, ring the bell if you want to be notified. All the good stuff. And until next time guys, see ya!